My guest has been on this show before when he was promoting uh, the documentary Cocaine Cowboys a few years ago. His 30 for 30 on the U is uh, some must-see stuff. So is Screwball, the documentary film about the biogenesis scandal from his uh, native Miami, Florida. Good to see you, Billy Corbin. How are you, brother? I'm great, thanks. Um, so let's get into this thing right here. This documentary is about the Tony Bosch scandal that got A-Rod a year's suspension. Manny Ramirez got popped and Melky Cabrera got popped. Uh, why did you make this documentary, Billy? Actually, in November of 2013, we were pitched by Alex Rodriguez. The, oh, okay. So this... <laughs> you're laughing already at that. Wait, what? Okay, because again, this documentary is not very... Um, What's the word for, um, it's not very complimentary to Alex I'm Rodriguez. I'm not getting an invitation to the wedding, if that's what you mean. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, But it's also extremely accurate. It's all very true. It's all exactly how it happened. Well, I mean, the stories are, be are being told by Tony Bosch, or yeah. Dr. Tony Bosch, well, as he referred doctor, to himself. Air quotes. In quotes, yeah. who was the one who was at the center of all of this, and his dad was the one who was writing yeah. the prescriptions for these drugs. Uh, and, and also the uh, fellow Porter Fisher, who was the one who leaked the documents so the whistleblower. The whistleblower, we'll if you will. Him, yeah. And these guys are telling the story from their own first person and your unique way in which you you have them tell their stories, we'll get to in a second. But this is absolutely straight from the horse's mouths that we're seeing right here. Yeah, why all first would, person. Why yeah. did Alex Rodriguez pitch you this idea? So in November of 2013, he was in the midst of the arbitration with MLB. He was the only one of the players involved in the biogenesis scandal that appealed his suspension. I guess why not? What do you have to lose? It was the longest suspension in the history of the game. 211 so he, games. Yeah, he went for it. And so... He took a break from that arbitration and came down to his office in Coral Gables in the uh, suburb, very affluent suburb of Miami, where the University of Miami is actually located. Alex Rodriguez Field is located. And uh, his publicist hit me up and said, Alex would like to meet with you to discuss the possibility of doing a tell all documentary. And I was like, hell yeah, I'll take that meeting. Yeah, uh, I thought we were going to do it real hush hush and quiet at his office. And it turns out they wanted to meet us on a weekday at high noon at the most popular restaurant in town, like the power lunch spot of Coral Gables, which is like two miles from UM, which if any anywhere I'm going to get recognized because of the U documentaries, it's going to be at with, this place, that proximity to UM. Yeah. And so it was very clear that my producing partner, Alfred Spellman, and I were attended that event as like pawns in Alex's kind of PR offensive against MLB at the time. You remember it was like they were in a battle of the legacies, Bud Selig and, and, and Alex. Well, were, I mean, so. yeah, there was a, a, a whole story about how the protesters outside were actually paid for by yeah. Alex Rodriguez. I don't know if that was ever Absolutely. It's documented. All true. Okay. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, and it was it was ugly. There was no other yeah. way to describe it. You know what it is? I think Major League Baseball has become like, uh, I think, everything else in American life, including politics. It's the WWE, you know, and back when Bud Selig, the steroid commissioner, was on his way out the door on the eve of his retirement, was kind of like, well, maybe I should do something about this now that this scandal has erupted in 2013. He talks to his second command, Rob Manfred, and says, let's look like we're doing something about this. So they come down to Miami, have this farcical investigation that involves the MLB investigators. They have like this internal FBI of like former cops. They go, they sleep with a former nurse of Tony Bosch at one of his clinics. They're paying people off. They've got a slush fund of 125,000 grand that they're buying stolen medical records in a diner from a convicted felon. The whole thing is just utterly absurd. And then they nail Alex because what bigger scalp could you get than, yeah. than Alex Rodriguez? And right. then Bud retires, Rob Manfred takes over, and he goes, well, what's the storyline now? What better than to make a heel a hero and bring back not only A-Rod, but, you know, but Charlie Hustle you know, to, the, to the game to become commentators and Pete Rose, and who's not there anymore, of course, but like, and it worked. I mean, it's a bottom line company and, and, and it's a brilliant storyline. Now, are you saying Major League Baseball was orchestra has orchestrated two, two well, what used to be two fifths of the people on the set of Fox Baseball? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that it's it's awfully convenient and it's awfully brilliant. I think Alex is spectacularly good at that job. He I don't is? knock his hustle at all. He's, you know, and so he's he's earned 
that position. He certainly lightened up. He's a lot funnier, a lot mm-hmm. more self-effacing, um, certainly more so than the guy I met for lunch in November of 2013, who was in you know a battle for his life, his legacy, his career, his livelihood, and who spent an hour, hour and a half just lying right to our faces about everything, ever meeting Tony Bosch, ever cheating or using performance enhancing drugs at that stage of his uh, career. It was a pretty wild meeting. And uh, needless to say, after that, we didn't hear back much from them. Yeah, I was going to ask yeah. you, Billy Corbin, the, uh, <laughs> the director of uh, Screwball, about the biogenesis scandal, again, in theaters Friday and then numerous streaming platforms the following Friday after that. W- how did the meeting with A-Rod finish up? I mean, what happened? With just more lies, uh, basically. And so we walked away. I thought he was a fascinating guy, really a fragile guy, a mm-hmm. sensitive guy. At the time, not much of a sense of humor or se- any se- uh, sense of self-awareness. But I thought, what a compelling character to be able to examine, to interview. Um, and I inter- emailed them for the next six, seven, eight months. The uh, the arbitration resolved in January of 2014. He mm-hmm. got a sentence reduction, if you will, but still, I think, a season long yes. suspension. And so by the middle of 2014, it seemed obvious that they were not really interested in in participating in an in a interview or a documentary. And, and why not? The strategy has paid off. This whole kind of head in the sand, ignore it and it'll go away strategy has certainly worked for them. I think it's one of the most remarkable image rehabilitations in the history of public relations. Well, it's not just that, though. I mean, he had he did come out and when he did show back up with the with the Yankees, he came out and threw himself basically uh, on uh, on the the sword. I mean, he did come out and give a complete total mea culpa. He went and made fun of himself on the stage at the ESPYs. I mean, he has had, as you pointed out, you said no sense of humor about himself or anything like that. He has seemed to take a total reverse pivot on how he has portrayed himself or how he has uh, taken on what he did. Absolutely. And well, so, I, well do you I, know I wouldn't who, say, who, who, okay, you, you, I wouldn't you say seem to he, be taking. I wouldn't say little, he did a much of a mea culpa tour. He didn't really acknowledge what he did or didn't do, what right. he lied about. The other players like Ryan Braun that he threw under the bus, that his camp deliberately leaked in order to take some of the attention away from him in the thick of the scandal. I don't think he really fessed up to it. I don't think that he has to. I mean, obviously he doesn't have to, um, but right. I'm just saying I don't think he really did any kind of uh, uh, comprehensive apology or discussion about, I think, how profoundly disappointing it was for legions of, of young kids who look up to these athletes as heroes and role models. So then somebody who uh, did speak with him when he was at a low point, yeah. and then, as you point out, you think you were used as a prop or used in a certain way. For Incidentally, his- I'm totally cool with that. They spelled no. my name right in page six. <laughs> it was in bold. I don't have the juice to make that happen. No. Thank you, Alex. Thank you to his publicist. This is all just setting up the, the ultimate <laughs> question, and I think a lot of fans are wondering, hearing this, if they already weren't wondering it to begin with. Who's the Alex Rodriguez that we're seeing today? I think a, a liberated man. I think this was okay. a guy who was kind of trapped by uh, his own kind of failed persona in baseball, mm-hmm. um, who was booed by his own fans in baseball, never really a beloved pop culture figure. Right. I think a guy who was almost in a way liberated when he hit rock bottom in this scandal and now feels free to. I, I hope this is him, meaning like I think maybe that this is the, you know, the person he was always supposed to be and always wanted to be, but felt constrained by fame and, and, and fortune. And of course, when you're generating that kind of revenue over $400 million over a career, you have so many people around you who rely on you. And so you don't really have a chance to kind of free yourself and go out in public and, and, and feel like you can joke around and just be you. And I, I think, uh, I think it's liberating for someone to be out of the game. Like the only game he's, the only thing he's ever known, the only thing he's ever been told he's good at. And the interesting thing about screwball is it turns out it's not about Alex Rodriguez. Don't tell him that, but it's not about a rod. It's about these bizarre Elmore Leonard, Carl Hyacin, almost Coen brothers esque characters it's a great who way to put it. inhabit this only in Miami kind of world and um it's the weirdest birdcage I've ever seen it's bizarre and and, you, know and I mean? you can't make it up because it's it's so, it's such nonsense like Without it's literally the we are family ending you know where it's they're all walking out singing salon. we are family it all goes down well, I mean, in who, who's, it, who's in drag who's Gene Hackman I know you're they, you're you're, <laughs> t- you're talking about uh Tony Bosch who is at the center of all of this who's the one who is dispensing all of the the steroids uh, using his dad's script paper pad yeah. to, to who's get... Who's a legit doctor. Right, a dad, legit yeah. doctor. And then this fella, Porter Fisher, who yeah. is just a... I don't know what, what... What what do you describe him, the one who was the one who gave the... Who stole the 
he essentially took the documents from Tony Bosch, who just let it lying around the biogenesis office, took them yeah. and sent them to the press yeah, because it, he was pissed about not getting four thousand dollars back. It's a, you know, it's a chunk of change, nice chunk of change. But even Tony Bosch in your documentary said he wishes he had paid that money to avoid everything else that had happened. It's insane. I think I'm more interested in hearing how you describe Porter Fisher after having watched the documentary. I I guess one would would just be a sad figure who's just looking for some sort of relevance, you know? That's what I... And he found it, it to be. in these documents, and he took these documents from, so he stole the documents from Tony Bosch, and then the documents were stolen from him and sold not just to the highest bidder, but every bidder. I mean, anybody willing to pay anything for them, and including Major League Baseball, who's paid 125000 cash in a diner out of some slush fund. I presume. I don't think they were going to 1099 the convicted felon that they were buying these knowingly stolen documents uh, from. I don't know where MLB gets a slush fund from, but but so be it. Uh, I, don't, I don't knock. I don't knock their hustle either. Rob Manford was in charge of this entire investigation. But listen, you go down to Miami. I mean, when you roll around in the swamp, you're going to get yeah, some mud on I, I you. Guess you know, so, I mean, you know what I mean? They play you dirty gotta, down there. If you got to you got to root this thing out. I mean, you know, in 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 a, in a way too, because. Everybody was saying, you know, how does how does the NFL not get the TMZ tapes of all these players that that TMZ has the tapes on? Yeah. And the reason why is they're they're not going to take some sort of. Could you imagine if the NFL? Nobody trusts them. Well, 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 <laughs> That's well, what it is. Well, I was just saying, could you imagine if the NFL took a slush fund and gave it to somebody who, for whatever their reason, wanted to leak this tape when they had no right to? Could you imagine? You're assuming the they blowback? don't do that. They don't. Otherwise, they, right. they, they, you know what I'm saying, Billy? They don't because otherwise they'd have the tape. Well, well and here, well, before here's what Harvey Levin does. Well, right. here's what uh, what they did. These convicted felons, while they're selling MLB the stolen documents for cash in a diner, they had a buddy at another table with an iPhone filming the transaction so that they could sell the video of the transaction to a Rod to say like, hey, you can then release this video. And they wound, up getting, they wound up getting scared about this and they deleted it from the hard drive. And, but, they, but A-Rod bought a, a blank hard drive from them for six figures. We have the wire transfer, it's in the documentary. And, they, and A-Rod allegedly spent thousands more sending the hard drive around the world to data recovery services to try to get this deleted footage back and unfortunately couldn't and so we got um, footage America's we got, sweetheart <laughs> Alex it's Rodriguez just, it's hysterical <laughs> but like listen I don't he was desperate and, and he, he grew up in Miami it's like sunny place for shady people you know he's gonna it, it rubs off on you and the, the type of characters you surround yourself to and the fact that when you think about it the career of the highest paid baseball player in history effectively ended over a four thousand dollar debt between a cocaine addicted fake doctor and his fake tan addicted steroid patient <laughs> is it's just kind of wonderful. By the way, Billy Corbin, you I mean Nailed you put it. a fine point on it. it. Uh, I mean you stuck the landing on that one, and 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 that's why your documentary is called Screwball. And I guess we kind of buried the lead, which is a great way to finish up our conversation here. Is there's so many stories that required reenactment because you don't have the footage, obviously, yeah. of Tony Bosch talking to Porter Fisher or Porter Fisher to Oogie, who was uh, A Rod's <laughs> guy, right? I mean, you don't have these, you don't have these these moments documented with film, so you recreated yeah. them using children. Oh my God, I can't. T- I mean, what? Wh- why did you think that? I have a theory as to why? I guess you said it at the very beginning, mm. but. Because some of the things these guys are saying, it sounds like they're five years old. And you you, you use kids who are like literally, what, eight, 10, 12 years old? Eight, nine, 10, yeah, right around there. Saying the most foul things. Yeah. You know, (laughs) but but you're using their their mouths. Yeah, they're mouthing. They're mouthing. They're mouthing. mouthing, 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 Yes. You're using Tony Bosch's um, sit down interview off camera, but on camera are the kids mouthing, wearing hair pieces and dressed up. Facial hair, yeah. And we have to remember, like, when we make sports documentaries, like the U 30 for 30, for example, um, it's, I don't mean to knock our hustle. It's still a, documentaries are a challenge to make, but the formula is clear. You talk to sports people. Sports people talk to you about sports games. You go get footage of sports games and put sports game footage on top of sports people talking about sports. That's that's how it goes. Mm -hmm. Here, this wasn't about sports. Uh, Yeah, it was baseball adjacent, but all these events occur in some shady fake doctor's clinic, in a locker room, at a hotel, at a bar, at a nightclub, for example, live in Miami Beach, uh, the Fountain Blue. And so what do you do? There's no footage. So we did recreations. We knew we were going to have to. And I was listening to the characters talking during the interviews, Tony and Porter, uh, who don't like each other. Spoiler. 
spoiler alert. <laughs> but, but, um, but they have a very similar way of talking. And they talk in dialogue. They're like, I walked into his office and I said, where's my money? And he said, I don't have your money. And I said, you better get my money. And he says, what are you going to do about it? And I said, I'm going to break your neck. And I'm like, oh, By we the way, can- I appreciate you cleaning up the conversation. No, that, yeah, <laughs> it's a little more vulgar uh, than that. But um, I, I realized we could drunk history this because they're talking in yeah. dialogue. So we have the actors it. lip sync the dialogue, but the actors will all be eight, nine, and 10 years old. And not only did, did it strike me that they all acted like children, uh, but it kind of works for me on multiple layers, not the least of which is is that, you know, Tony Bosch ultimately and rightfully so went to federal prison for not only treating professional athletes, but high school kids yeah, that's as well, whose parents and coaches brought them to Tony Bosch to try to get an advantage in the in the draft. Um, and so that combined with the fact that, like I said, in the end, we, we deal with this a little bit. The, these athletes are heroes and role models to young children. And they're sending a message loud and clear. And the kids are getting it because I do Q&As with some of the actors, the young actors from the movie, who answer the question of the audience when they say, what is the moral of the story? What did you learn? What are we right. supposed to glean from all this? Yes. And Brian Blanco, the young kid who plays Tony Bosch in the lab coat and everything, he says, oh, oh I know, I know. I'm like, you don't have to raise your hand. It's a Q&A. It's all <laughs> yours, dude. The floor is yours. He's 10. What are you going to do? Right. He said, lie, cheat, and steal, and that's how you win. Oh, no. And I'm like, and when it comes from him, it's a little more depressing than when I say it. But the truth of the matter is, this is these are the lessons that we're teaching but who our won, children who now. Who won in this? I mean, who won in this? I know obviously Alex is a totally new life and a new reputation, and he's living it, and he's living it well. Mm-hmm. But Tony Bosch is a convicted felon. I, I didn't see, I didn't look at anybody in this movie and say these people have won. You know, I mean, and and I, I honestly, not not a single person comes off like. Um, anything positive in a way in this whole situation. Although again, I, I don't blame baseball for doing whatever the heck it needed to do to root this thing out. That's, that's my belief, but just seeing at the end of this thing, hey, Pedro Gomez came off fine. You know, I guess, I'm, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I think he's the only one. And by the way, the, the child who plays him is remarkable. <laughs> he's remarkable. Well, um, so look, Billy, this is, this is just, uh, this is truly something else, man. But last one for you here. Did, did you believe Tony Bosch? I mean, because the guy's using, he's still referring to people he was treating as patients. I mean, come on now. Did, did you, did, did, he goes to jail. He, obviously, he's got a story to tell, but he also has. I'll tell you, one person who believes in Tony Bosch is Tony Bosch. Uh, that man has a lot of self-confidence. And, and despite the fact that he went to medical school in Belize, what one of our interview subjects refers to as the Belize School of the Medical and Performing Arts, um, <laughs> he, he very much is a true believer in his own ability. And I will tell you, this guy didn't do at traditional advertising because this was very much a gray market business yeah. at best. He, he thrived on word of mouth. And he got that word of mouth because he got results for his clients. So he was doing something right. And I'll tell you, one of the epilogues we didn't get to do in the, in the movie Yes. ran out of time and money but um tony winds up in minimum security federal prison a camp in alabama and he is there teaching nutrition to his fellow <laughs> inmates uh, jeff skilling from enron is there no teaching business to their fellow <laughs> inmates and jesse jackson jr is in prison there teaching political science oh, and civics gosh. to his fellow inmates and um, yeah, I mean, listen, we're just trying to MAGA, trying to make A-Rod great again. That's what we're trying to do, you know? <laughs> it works. Dr. Hannibal Lecter is teaching a class on culinary <laughs> arts. I mean, oh my gosh. <laughs> Billy, thanks for coming on, man. You made thanks a great, a great wow. film. Check Maybe. out uh, Screwball in select cities this Friday and then uh, on numerous streaming platforms the Friday after that, at Billy Corbin on Twitter and Instagram. Good to see you, brother. Thanks, Rich. Back with more in a moment. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.